Well, welcome. Glad you're all here. Some familiar faces from our last session. Um, I hope we can uh, help you out with this one as well and, and engage you in some, some information. See, there's that little sign that says it's not working. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is a couple of, of topics that I think go together, and I've done some work around this, and I've done some work with organizations that have hired me to come in and work around these things, it is a little bit about productive conflict and difficult conversations. And it certainly, you could say they're separate, but they're not, because often to have good productive conflict, we have to be able to have those difficult conversations in a way that are, that are productive, that work out for us. So um, I think these two things are really connected well. So what we're going to talk about is a little bit about how to have that conversation that um, maybe you've been avoiding. Um, on my website, as a consultant, um, I have the handout for this session. Um, I have a PDF of the PowerPoint uh, posted. Also have some references around uh, books and articles and things you might want. It's pretty, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's certainly some things you could read and look at if you'd like. Um, and all of those are at the at inspired dash engagement forward slash workshop dash resources. There's also an evaluation link there that you just go to a, uh, a Google forms and uh, give me some, some feedback on, on what you think of all this. I would, I just really, really encourage you to do that. I, I love the feedback. I need the feedback. Uh, we're going to meet again next week. I hope a lot of you are back. Um, and you can let me know what we could do differently or improve or, or not improve. Um, I just like feedback. It really, really helps. Um, I think that helps build that sense of community also that I, that I talk about a lot. So what are we going to do here today? Today, we're going to talk a little bit. This is a little bit of me presenting this first uh, session. And then next week is a whole lot more of you getting to do some work. They're a little bit of both. I, I won't suggest that I'm, you're just going to sit there and listen. But um, it's a little more presenting uh, focus this first week. And then next week's a, a little more um, opportunity for you to get involved. So what we're going to do today is talk about what is productive conflict. Uh, why is it good? Why do we want it? Why would we ever want conflict? Um, just kind of uh, hit some of the high points of, of productive conflict. And then we're going to talk about civility. And you may wonder why we would talk about that. And I think I can make the case for that in our presentation here. Um, I, I have been very busy the last year traveling to businesses and colleges around the country, um, hired specifically to improve the civility between employees. And it's pretty amazing that they would have to hire somebody to do that. Um, not that I mind doing it, but still pretty amazing. Um, and then uh, we're going to focus on the first part of how to have those conversations. And we're going to talk about what, what's interest-based dialogue. Some of you, uh, especially those of you in Maricopa, have uh, aware of interest-based negotiation, interest-based problem solving, and you may be just sick and tired of hearing about it. Um, because I know it is a, a tool that we use in Maricopa a lot for a lot of reasons, and it, it's because it's a really good tool. But we're going to talk about it in the context of having conversations, and I hope that will, will be a good way to, to present that. And then next week, same time, same station, but those of you old enough, and I don't see any pictures of you, but same bat time, same bat station. Um, we used to have the Batman TV shows. Um, we're going to really delve into crucial conversations, which is the the, the uh, method of having difficult conversations through a, a book called Crucial Conversations. If you want to read ahead, uh, you probably can get that on your Kindle pretty easily. Um, it is one of the two or three um, most recommended by me. I recommend the most leadership books in you know, all the leadership academies and other um, uh, kinds of leadership coaching and executive coaching that I do. This is right near the top for, for everybody to, to have. And a nice little kiss. Kevin, say hi for us. That, that's, by the way, that should happen. I don't know if you were watching, but Kevin just got a kiss on top of the head. That, that is what these um, uh, sessions should look like, by the way. And if you're doing Zoom in your teams at work, that is exactly what it should look like. Um, we are part of our family. We are part of our pets. We are part of our, of our homes now. And, and we, should, we should embrace all of that and acknowledge it whenever we can. So um, thank her for coming in and doing that. And I've, I'm glad, I'm glad you've got the support at home. Um, but what we'll really focus on that second week is as we go through crucial conversations, I'm going to actually help you build a script for a conversation that you're struggling to have. 
There may be one out there, just one in particular. It could be somebody outside of work, inside of work, colleague, a boss, um, whatever it is. We're actually going to help you create a script. Actually, I'll go right through it so that you can have a, a plan for how you could go have that conversation when you're ready to do so. Um, so, what is productive conflict? Um, the definition's kind of long in, in whatever here. An open exchange of conflicting or differing ideas which parties feel equally heard. I think that's a really important part of this. Productive conflict, the, the key there is people feel heard. We do our research around employee engagement. And when I work with, with organizations to figure out how they're doing their strategic planning or how their leadership teams are communicating with their employees or whatever that is, the, the message is consistent. And that is that people don't get to make the decisions, but they do have to be or have to feel like they've been heard. And that doesn't mean you send out a survey and take a bunch of check boxes and move on. It means that even in a team that's making a decision and having a discussion, the decision may not be left up to a vote on that team. Democracy is not what business is about all the time. It's not about consensus. It isn't. It can't be. Or I think those of us that I think most of you here are in higher ed, consensus can take for fricking ever. And that may not be what we can do, especially in today's quick moving. And I don't mean the last month of, of the virus crisis, but our, our world is moving too fast to sometimes have that long drawn out discussion around consensus. However, we must absolutely must create an atmosphere where everybody at the table, everybody in the group has an opportunity to feel that they have been heard, not just an opportunity to speak, but heard. Then when the decision is made, they understand they've contributed to the decision. They may not get it their way. It may not be exactly what they said, but they feel heard. They feel valued that way. Um, they are respected. Their opinions are respected. It doesn't mean that, again, it's not a democracy. Those opinions are respected. They are unafraid to a voice dissenting opinions. And I'm going to suggest that is probably our biggest barrier to productive conflict, is that in a meeting, in a session with your team, with others, it's, it's hard to disagree. Um, it's, it's not something that, that we do a good job of creating a safe environment, an environment where people can, um, feel comfortable disagreeing for a lot of reasons, but what one of our goals in all of this will be to create some ways of communicating and ways of setting up the environment where people will feel quote unquote safe to have that conversation. And of course, the whole reason of this <clears throat> is to reach a mutually agreed resolution. Um, agreed doesn't mean vote, doesn't mean consensus, but it does mean that somehow we're comfortable with the resolution. <clears throat> so whatever that team is deciding or whatever you are going through on a one-on-one -on -one conversation, that at least you both walk away from there comfortable. <clears throat> may not be that you always agree. The key to this is that productive conflict starts with trust. And that's what we don't have a lot in our teams. <clears throat> Excuse me. We do have trust in that we trust the meeting's going to start at 11 and everybody's going to be 10 minutes late. We trust that our, our manager is a good person. You know, we, we trust that. We trust that, you know, the organization will do things a certain way or people will get stuff done a certain way. That's trust. And that's fine. And that's good. What we don't have is something called vulnerable trust. And vulnerable trust is a relationship between people where they are willing to be vulnerable in the face of others. I'm willing to go to the meeting and say, I didn't get it done. I'm willing to go to the meeting and say, I'm over my head. I don't know how to do this. I need help. And not feel like when we throw that out there, that vulnerability out there, that we are in some way um, lessening ourselves in the views of our colleagues. So we've created a, a relationship with them that we are able to admit um, failure, struggles, but we're also willing to talk about our successes and not feel like we're bragging and to talk about what we are doing well. It is a relationship where we can be vulnerable and open to others. Some of you may have caught the wave of Brene um, Beard, the, the lady who's writing a lot and she was on 60 Minutes last week and um, written a lot of books. The most recent one is Dare to Lead. She talks a lot about vulnerable trust. Um, a lot of the work that I do is in the five behaviors of cohesive teams, work by uh, Patrick Lencioni. 
um, that, that is offered as a tool and a workshop through the DISC organization um, is also all about vulnerable trust and how to build that in the team. Um, productive conflict is, is not personal. We are, that's that trust piece. It's not about the people. It's about the topic. We can disagree about the topic, and I'm, I'm going to suggest that sometimes it always, in, in always, and I don't mean in the last four years, and I don't mean even in the last month, is in, in America anyway, our politics have often become about people, not about topics. Let, let's debate the issue and, and respect the person. And I think sometimes we, as, a, as a, a world, have shifted away from that. And I think that's why we have a struggle with conflict now, even in our workplaces, is that our model, the people who should be modeling away for us, um, aren't at least in a way to have productive conflict. They're having conflict, but they're not having productive conflict. And of course, that's because they don't have vulnerable trust. Such an easy thing to say, such a hard thing to develop. So I'm not suggesting there's an easy solution to that. But I would suggest that that's what we would strive for. Productive conflict's not negative. It's not. It's, it's a good thing. Um, and it is uncomfortable. Conflict is never something that we just jump up and down and, oh boy, we get to disagree. Um, I, I am somebody that is more comfortable with conflict than somebody else. Those of you who were in the strength session recently, command is one of my themes, and that is a theme that is better with conflict than my, <clears throat> if you had harmony. But I don't, still don't enjoy it. I don't love having it. I just understand the power of it. And I hopefully can understand how to have that conflict in a productive way, even in situations where someone else might not feel the trust that I might. So why would we do this? Why is it important to have conflict in a group, in a team, or in, in, in a relationship? Well, <clears throat> you get your problems identified earlier. One of our struggles with not having conflict is that we, we don't say things, we don't speak up when we should um, be, be talking about what's going wrong. Some of the, the biggest cu organizational culture failures in the world have come from the, the fear of people speaking up. Um, we, have, we have organizations that have, that have had tremendous ethical problems in their organization. And part of that's because nobody spoke up. They were afraid to, for whatever reason. And I think if we can have productive conflict at, at that level, at all levels, <clears throat> we maybe can find some of those problems earlier and, and have a better outcome. We're better at problem solving. Problems aren't solved by one solution. Problems are solved by multiple solutions, and, and having that conflict can help you reach that. Healthier relationships, higher morale, more commitment to the outcome. You've had a conflict, which means you feel like you've been heard. You buy in better, and then you have that next level up if you use the five behaviors of the teams, <clears throat> vulnerable trust, productive conflict, followed by commitment. You build that commitment level in people. Improve productivity. We do things better. We do it more efficiently because we're working together rather than working against each other that cooperative uh, attitude, that cooperative relationship comes from having conflict, being able to talk through and disagree about things. And then personal growth and insight. You learn how you function within conflict and you also learn about yourself as, as you hear the issues of conflict that arise from others. So it actually helps you to have that kind of conflict. It teaches us to listen. Productive conflict cannot happen unless people feel heard, which means you have to listen not just be in the room thinking about how you disagree with them. If that's your, if that's your mantra is that or what you do even now, you're sitting there looking at your computer and you're hearing me talk and what's going on in your head is, well, yeah, I know why that won't work. Stop. Stop for a minute. And instead, suspend judgment. Just for now. It doesn't mean you have to agree with me. I, I'm not suggesting that in any way. But I am asking you to stop and suspend judgment so that you hear it out first so that you, you can listen and really understand where, where whatever the comments are, are coming from. And then you can make your own personal analysis and you can develop a response. But when we are already dismissing the, the input because of our relationship or lack of trust, or it's just the way we've been taught to do it in our heads, we're not going to reach a, a level of productive conflict. Um, it, it does give you an opportunity to verbalize your needs. It, it gives you an opportunity to have conflict and saying, I need this if we're going to do that. If we're going to do that, then I need this. I need more resources. I need more of this. I, it, gives you, 
gives you an opportunity to communicate that because sometimes that's hard to say unless you have productive content. <coughs> Excuse me. Opens your eyes to new ideas. It's creative. There's people around the table that have good ideas. Teaches us patterns of behavior. We see how other people in the room behave. We start to learn more about it in a, what I'll suggest from those of you who were here before, a strengths perspective, a natural talent perspective without taking the Clifton Strengths Assessment. We start to see their patterns of behavior. How do they operate in conflict? How do they operate around problem solving? So that we can lean on them and lean into their strengths when we need them because they might be quite different than ours. And of course, leads to more productivity and therefore better solutions. So that's, that's a little bit about what productive conflict is, right? It is, it is necessary. It is purposeful. It's something that we want to have happen. Um, we, we have to work at it. It's not something that comes naturally and easily. Let's shift a little bit to civility because a, a significant portion of having that productive conflict is being able to be civil with each other. And that doesn't mean you have to like everybody. It doesn't mean you have to hug them. It, it, that's not what civility is. Civility is being, being polite and respectful when you have conflict. Incivility, and we'll define it in the negative, is one or more rude, discourteous, or disrespectful actions that may or may not have a negative intent behind them. You don't always mean to be incivil when you are, but you are. And so I think that's what one of the things that we need to make sure that we spend some time on in our workplace is, in, is really enforcing and holding each other accountable to be civil to each other. I think that's critical to what we're doing. So why in the world in this middle of this presentation, in this webinar, are we talking about civility? Why would that be the topic that popped up in the middle of this? Because there's a lot of ways to approach productive conflict. Well, and by the way, that picture, you probably recognized it from one of your meetings. Here's some research, and it's just, just that. And you can do with it what you wish, and you can question the authority, and sometimes that's, that's a legitimate question always. I think these are solid enough where I wouldn't put them up here. Um, but you can adapt that how you want. Civility in America in 2018 was a, was a, a, a survey that was done by a large um, corporation that, that specializes in this kind of research. 93% of the Americans reported that a lack of civility is a problem in society. 93% think civility is a problem, incivility is a problem. And 69% said it's a major problem. Well, that's a lot of people. That's a huge number of people that think our incivil behaviors are causing negative consequences in our world. The number of, of relationships and actions and encounters that are not civil have right grown over the last few years. Here's 16, 17, and 18. And you can see the overall number went up quite a bit. The relationship between online and face-to-face -face is, is not changed a lot because we think that this is all about social media. We think it's all about bad Facebook posts and being ugly there. There's a tremendous amount of, of incivility going on face to face and over emails and things that might be more personal because the email is in the person sitting next to you in the office, which is which is certainly that person offline, even though you're using technology to maybe get that through. It keeps popping up, but it does. Um, so how about just employees in general, not just the America as a whole? Uh, look at the numbers between 2008 and 2013, and I'm not putting those dates there for any reason other than that's when the research was done. That's not making a statement about what's gone on between 8 and 13 or anything, not at all. I think you can draw conclusions if you wish. Um, somewhere, you know, 80 or a little bit below report encountering issues of incivility, and then look at 98% in 2013 experienced some incivility at work. Um, at least half the incivility occurred at least once a week. That's an outrageous number. But I'm going to tell you, being in the workplace and being in a faculty setting in higher ed, that number is very realistic in many circumstances. And some of you that have been involved in Maricopa, and there's quite a few here is why I mentioned that, um, know where some of that was over the last year or two, We've we, maybe three. We've had some real tough issues um, throughout our district and our colleges that it created some, some incivil kinds of communication. Now let's talk purely about faculty to faculty because let's narrow it down a little bit to higher ed, right? <clears throat> Look at this one, this 2013, 70% of faculty surveyed perceived incivility among 
and between faculty as a moderate to severe problem. These are the colleges that are hiring me to come in and work with the department about how their faculty are getting along. This is not about you getting along with your boss. This is about faculty to faculty, about colleagues, about coworkers, and that in that that in civil action and, and communication with each other is just off the charts. Um, guess what? That affects our students. Whether we are being in civil with them, not an issue. May be an issue, but not this issue. <clears throat> but it does affect how students perceive us because there's no doubt that they know that goes on. They see it, they feel it, and it and it contributes and models the way for them as they move forward. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a minute to look at the questions of what we call the Clark Workplace Civility Index. Um, Cynthia Clark is, has done quite a bit of research around faculty and civility, particularly in nursing education, which is a, a subsection of the faculty, of course, but that seems to be a, an emphasis of in civil, in civil kinds of behaviors right now. Um, a couple of the departments I work with are nursing departments. Um, so not pick on nursing in any way, but she has a, an index. So. Um, this is in the handout in a much more laid out way. I would never put this many words on a slide. This is against everything as an educator I would ever do. But I don't know any other way to put this up here for you. So if you want to rank yourself on how often you do these things on a scale of one to five, I'll give you about two minutes here to kind of run through them and make your own tab in your head. And then we'll talk about what the results mean. sentences there in there <clears throat> if you download the handout at some point <clears throat> you you'll have these questions on a form that you could actually score uh, it's got the Likert scale right there next to the questions and um, I, I think the message uh, and I'll give you the scores what they mean here in a second but that's less important to me than these are the behaviors that represent civil behavior so um, if you're doing this you're being civil so if you are working with a group or you're working with others that are, that are having less than civil behavior, <clears throat> these are the behaviors that you would like to build, that you would like them all to be able to score fives on. <clears throat> the reality is few people would ever score five on all of these. It's just not human. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's just not reality. But um, if we can score in the higher numbers in this as a group, then I think we're going to have a better relationship and have more productive conflict. So here's here's uh, Cynthia's uh, numbers. <clears throat> so if you do score somewhere around 90 to 100 in out of those 20 questions, um, very civil. 80 to 90 is where an awful lot of people fall uh, or, or self-score. What's interesting is if you have people take this for themselves and then you have them take it, projecting it on the others on their team. Those scores are usually quite disparate. People tend to grade themselves much more civil than they are perceived. That's an interesting finding. So if you're doing this with a group of people, that isn't to say they need to pick out somebody there to talk about. That's not how you build this. But if you can <clears throat> help the team understand that they're perceived differently than they're behaving, sometimes that can be a, a, an eye-opening experience for them to, to start to have then a conversation about well, what can I do to, to be more civil or to be perceived as more civil? So, just an interesting tool for you to use or work with as you wish. Again, it's in the handout if you'd like to use that. This is, um, you know, it's, it's drawn this way on purpose. It could be in a circle and would probably be okay too. Um, stress leads to incivility. When people are under stress, they are less likely to be civil to, to others. They get uptight, they get nervous, they feel less safe. 
they're fearful. All those things happen under stress and we're not civil. And being in civil creates more stress, right? So when when we are we are acting that way, we create stress in people around us and in ourselves. And of course, being stressful causes that to happen. Well, in our world today, I'm gonna challenge most of you to to anybody to say they're not stressed a bit by what's going on. Um, you may be adapting well, you may not be adapting well, but it's still a stressful world right now. There's stuff unknown. And as we mentioned in the last session, you know, the, the fear of the unknown is, is a, a tough thing to deal with and creates an awful lot of, of disconnection and fear and in civil action. Well, being in civil leads to conflict and it's not productive conflict. It's bad conflict. Because we're not driving conflict for a purpose. We're driving it out of <clears throat> stress. So what we'd like to do is either lower our stress. Yeah, <clears throat> let's try to work on that. <clears throat> this isn't a meditation class and a, and a stress reduction program, which we can do, but and we should. But this is about being civil. So if we can figure out how even under stress that that our our actions, our normal actions are are not in civil then we might be able to reduce some of the conflict we're having because a lot of our conflict or non-productive conflict arises out of incivil behavior. And if we could stop that at the core, at the team level, we very likely could take our conflict and turn it into a more productive conflict. I think that might be the goal. So how do we do that? Well, we actually encourage people to look at that list from Clark's work or some of these very simple sorts of things I actually, and some of the teams I've worked with, have actually created a set of behavior guidelines. They've then put them in poster format. They're, they're nicely done by a graphic artist. They're put up on the wall. They passed out little wallet cards, and they said, these are the behaviors, the guidelines to behavior that we've all agreed to follow. And if somebody is not following one of these, it is, it is your right and obligation to call them out on it, and hold each other accountable. And they are things like to practice forgiveness. Forgive people for making a mistake. Forgive them for acting up when they're under stress. We all do it. Express gratitude. Be thankful. Appreciate other people. Affirm others. Give them positive feedback when it's appropriate. Listen and be present. Maybe one of the big ones. We have a tendency to drift off. Those of you, there's many of you that don't have your web cameras on. You're, you're okay doing that. And many of you are still staring at the screen and hanging on every word. Some of you are doing that so that you can do other things at the same time. And that's fine. That's okay. But if you were in a, a live situation in a room and doing that, it would certainly create a, a sense of not being civil and not listening and not respecting others that are speaking. Smile. Smile. <laughs> it's just not that hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's not that hard, though. <laughs> so smile more. That's all. That's a simple one. Don't interrupt people. Just don't interrupt. Let them finish. I struggle with that one sometimes. I got activator and command and all those things going and blah, 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 somebody talking and I, they're just dragging this conversation out forever and I just want to jump in and stuff. Um, sometimes as a teacher or a facilitator, you have to do that to keep things on track, but most of the time I need to stop doing that in a meeting and I work on it really hard. Don't make assumptions and that's what we're going to talk about next. Suspend judgment, huge, huge. Suspend it until the conversation's there and then you can judge it. It doesn't mean you stop judgment. You should judge what other people say, but don't do it while they're talking. Stop and listen. Then you can make your conclusions from that. Just say please and thank you. That, that is so simple, yet we've lost it in some ways. And I'm not just some old guy standing out there saying, get off my lawn. I don't mean that. I truly mean we have forgotten how to say please and thank you. Now, I do think it's happening a little more now. Uh, I see it in the community here when we go out to shop or we're trying to take out food when we can to support the local um, uh, vendors, you know, the local restaurants around here. And I and I hear a lot more of it, right? We really appreciate you being here. We appreciate you staying open. We appreciate your risk that you're in. I think there's a little more of that. And I, I'm going to tell you, this whole crisis that we're in the middle of could potentially have some great outcomes. Some great things could happen from this. And I hope that we find those and hold on to them along the way. Um, and then last, think before you speak. Just think. Think about the impact it's going to have on what you want to say. Here's three books. This is in the resources and the, <clears throat> in the handout. But three resources that I use when I'm working with teams. <clears throat> the, uh, Clark's work is really good around nursing. Um, 
I really like mastering civility. It's some how to's and some do's and don'ts that I think you can really enjoy. And then Forney's work too is really good. And it's, it's written in 25 little um, uh, chapters that are a page long, right? So it's quick read. It's easy, kind of some tips and, and all around the way. So, um, and it, again, the founder of the Hopkins civility project. So very well written and, and research. So I just would consider those as resources if you're interested in that. <clears throat> okay. So um, I didn't put this up on a poll. I've got a poll coming up. I didn't do it here, but just in, just in your head for a minute, I'd like you to answer this to yourself. You don't have to answer it publicly right now. Um, true or false? The most successful teams have very little conflict. The answer is false. Teams that don't have conflict are not successful. There is a continuum that when we take these assessments around having productive conflict on teams between uh, excessive harmony and being mean to each other. And where we'd like to be is in the middle somewhere. We don't want to have over harmony where we can't have conflict. Yeah, we don't want to be disrespectful on the other end. So the key is, is to find that balance to have good productive conflict consistently. We have to disagree. We have to bring up new ideas. The best teams, true or false? The best teams are made up of people who are comfortable, passionately arguing for their ideas. Good thing or a bad thing if the people on a team are passionate about their ideas. The answer is true. We want people that are passionate, right? Um, I, I can argue with, with the best of them to, to make sure that interests are met and I can do that passionately, right? That doesn't mean I'm not engaged. That doesn't mean I don't love the organization or I don't love the team. It means that I'm willing to be passionate about some of the interests that we need to, that I need, feel that we need to take care of. True or false, no matter what their cultural background, in family norms, people generally feel the same way about conflict. They prefer to avoid it. Most people prefer to avoid it. And the answer is actually false. Um, believe it or not, there's an awful lot of people out there that engage in conflict and engage with it well and um, are willing to have conflict. And it's across cultures, it's across genders, it's all of it. Okay. And then last, understanding team members' differing experiences um, with and feelings about conflict helps the team engage in unfiltered, productive debates. Yes. The more you know about how the others at the table have conflict, the better you can have conflict. That's a great thing. So learn about the folks by having conflict. Then you can learn how people have conflict and you can manage it as a team. Okay. So the question I would ask yourself is, how do you perceive conflict? Do you perceive it as just something to avoid at all costs? It just drains you, you hate it, it's terrible. Or do you view it as an opportunity? Is it a threat or is it something that can bring new good things to you? Um, I'm not suggesting you can just change overnight, but I'm suggesting that you try to shift your paradigm about conflict, that it's not always just a bad thing. It's how it's had that makes it a bad thing. And then what's your current approach to conflict? Do you have good productive conflict or do you withdraw? And that's the silence. Or do you get aggressive? That's the violence. When people don't feel safe, and we'll spend a lot of time with this next week, um, if people don't feel safe, they drift into one or other of those paradigms. They either withdraw and get silent and don't speak, or they get aggressive. And those are unsafe environments. Our job as a leader is to try to build that, that safety along the way. Conflict's inevitable. It's going to happen. Conflict can be managed, and it can be productive. I think that's what we have to understand. Conflict's everywhere, so let's manage it. Let's do our best with one another. Okay, here's a scenario. I'll read it to you, just because some people aren't watching or can't see the screen well. And then I've got a poll that'll ask you how you respond to this. So you're working closely with one of your colleagues on a project, and at least one of you has to be present at a status meeting every week with the vice presidents. Okay, you ask your colleague to cover for you in the meeting at the end of the month because you need to take the days off. You, you need that day off. He said no, because the agenda on that day covers some topics that much more aligns with your knowledge and expertise. And he doesn't have time to prepare for it because he has a different topic that he has to deliver this Tuesday, and it, which is much earlier than, than the other meeting. So he says no. Then early on Tuesday morning, right? 
you receive an email. This is the meeting that he had. You receive an email from him set late Monday night. You get up Monday morning and sign your email indicating that he's taking a sick day and will not be able to cover the Tuesday meeting, which is the one he was going to cover and couldn't cover yours for. And as a result, he needs you to cover for him. So I'm going to try this poll stuff and we'll see how it works. I'm going to open the poll. People who join the video system conference and can't view the content you're sharing. Don't get to be viewed by those people who share your screen or application instead. Okay. I'm not sure how that happened. So I have to share the poll. Is that what I'm doing? See, that shows you how well this works. Share. the poll there anywhere anybody should be able to just share that poll. looks like some of you have got it are you answering it we we can see it in the side window on the right okay. of this perfect as long as you can see it that's awesome so it's on the side window over by the chat rooms and stuff if you don't we'll drop down toward the bottom your your screen should light up with a with a, a bar Thirteen of you in a room. This thing says seven of you. Five of you still need to answer, but we're getting there. Pretty close. We're pretty split. Anybody else? I've got five more of you that I won't. If you're not, it's okay. You'll notice that of those you answered, the eight of you that answered, it's pretty even. Um, because I got to wait 17 seconds for people to finish submitting their responses here. Okay. Um, but it's pretty evenly spread, which obviously is a little bit unusual. <laughs> uh, maybe that's because we prepped it with a lot of discussion here about what's going on. Um, let's see if it pops it up here. Waiting one second and there, you probably can see that now, right? Share with attendees, full results. Apply. Okay. Did that work? I want to use this again. Did that work? Can you see the results now? Yes, we can see them. Awesome. Good. I'm glad that worked. Um, because the poll stuff's nice. I use Zoom a lot too, and it's a little easier polling system than this, but um that worked. That's good. Um so what you answered was pretty evenly between these three choices, between generous, hopeful, confident, angry, frustrated, spiteful, and sad, concerned, and anxious. What what I found very, very helpful is that some of you answered A. <laughs> there was a couple of you, but that's fine. You, you were generous and you were hopeful and you were confident. You looked at this in a positive lens. That's pretty cool <clears throat> because that is not usually the common answers. The common answer is B. That usually draws large numbers in a larger group that does the same question. <clears throat> that number becomes pretty high because you're frustrated that he didn't cover for you and now he wants you to cover for him. And oh my gosh, you know, it's just, who is this guy? And, uh, or another good answer could be that you're sad or concerned, that it's sad that he took the day off and you're sad the project might get her, but you're concerned about him. You're concerned about why he's sick or is he okay or how he's taking care of himself. So um, how you perceive that might help you understand how you first address conflict because that would be really easy to take that aggressive, frustrated, spiteful attitude and turn it into incivil behavior. And if you're thinking about it through a more generous, hopeful perspective, or even a concerned perspective, I think you can, you can take a different approach at how you might then address the issue. We don't know what the stakes are. We don't know how big that project is. We don't know how the vice presidents react to the information not being acted. We don't know. There's a lot of unknown there, but it give you some idea of how you might do that. So what I'm going to encourage you always to do is to look at any situation with curiosity. Whenever anybody just ticks you off <laughs> and they do something that just makes you angry. And, and, and I'm not talking about abuse or anything extreme. I'm talking about at work. I'm talking about somebody has some behavior that just makes you angry. You just go, how could they do that? Stop and, and look at them with curiosity. I've got another colleague that uses the word wonder. Look at them with wonder, right? Look at them with, with a, a, a sense of, hmm, what? How could a reasonable, rational, good human being act like that? And 
because most of the people that are behaving that way are good, reasonable, rational human beings. <laughs> They're not bad people. And so if you could do that, sometimes you can start to see the other way of looking at things. And that's what all, everything we're going to talk about from here on is, is understanding how to suspend your judgment long enough to hear their story. Because we, we assume a lot of facts, not in evidence, so to speak, if you watch a lot of LA Law or whatever the, 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 you know, the judge shows are on now, is that we assume a lot of facts. And they're, they're, they're not necessarily the same facts that somebody else sees the same way. So stop. Look at them with curiosity. I don't mean physically like the little pup here. But I mean, look at them with curiosity. Look at them with wonder. Ask yourself, how could they? Then maybe ask them, and we'll talk about the tools in order to do that. So it's one of the things, okay? So next week, a big focus on this, which is crucial conversations. I encourage you to, to take a look at the book at some point. You don't have to do it for next week by any means. But I think if after next week you want to, this is a great resource for you. It's a, a tool to use for crucial conversations when your opinions are, are opposing, the stakes are high, and the emotions are strong. And it's a great step-by-step uh, -step process on how to have that conversation. What we're going to talk about here for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes to get close this out is the whole idea of how to have interest-based conflict resolution. How do we talk about interest-based discussions and conflict between each other? The book behind that for you to read, the easy one to read, is not to go to Cornell and read all the research. It's great. Her interest-based programming is awesome, but it's deep and it's union-focused and it's heavier stuff. If you want to just talk about it from a, a closer to a layperson's perspective, this book is phenomenal. It's called Getting to Guess. It's an easy read. I think you would really enjoy it if you're interested in this perspective. Okay. So let's talk about what it is. Okay. Uh, and I know I'm moving right along. We got an hour to fill, and um, I don't want anybody to have to stay a lot longer than they originally intended. So I, that's why we're pushing a little bit through. So there are two ways to look at any kind of given problem. One of them is positional. I have a position. There's one solution, and it is a zero sum game. Uh, I want the room painted red. You want the room painted blue. That's my position. I want it red. Anything else I'm going to lose? And you want blue and anything else, you're going to lose. And it's zero sum. There's a winner and there's a loser. And the pie only has so many pieces. And now we can compromise. Let's mix them together and paint it purple. Who wins in that scenario? No one. Because I wanted it red, now it's purple. You wanted it blue, and now it's purple. And nobody's happy. Nobody wants that. Instead, let's take a peek. We got a little more family in the picture, didn't we? Um, Instead, let's take a peek at this through an interest-based perspective. Let's ask ourselves if there are other solutions. Now, how are we going to do that? We'll see in a second, but we're going to ask ourselves, what do we want, what do we need, what do we fear as a result of this decision? So why do I want red? What do I want to happen because it's red? What do I fear if it's not red? And if we can create an atmosphere that we can openly communicate that, we can find a new set of solutions. And instead of having the zero sum game, we're going to grow the pie and come up with solutions that everybody wins. And that's our goal is win, win, not win, lose, or lose, lose along the way. So in an adversarial assumption, which is when we're adversaries, for me to win, you must lose. <clears throat> I got to get my way. Even if it's not red, I'd sure as hell not going to be blue. Um, so we compete. We are naturally competitive people or not, we got to win. And that's the human nature in those, in those settings because you're taking a position. Um, you also understand that to help you is a sign of weakness in me. If I give in to you, then I'm not strong. I'm weak. I'm giving it to your way. I'm, not, I'm giving up something of myself. My power comes from opposing, criticizing, and beating you, of winning. Those are, those are really negative things, aren't they? And most importantly, our decision-making, our conflict, our discussion, our dialogues completely ignore the value of our relationship. It is all about the topic. It's all about winning. It's all about being right. It's all about a position. Rather than saying, we want a win-win solution, but I also want to retain and support and build our relationship. 
That's why if we can take an interest-based assumption, we can do something a little differently. We believe that all parties have a right to exist. All parties have legitimate interests. What do they want? What do they need? What do they fear? They're legitimate. I don't care what they say. They're legitimate. The dialogue, the discussion, the productive conflict can actually increase the relationship. It can make your relationship better as a result. The solutions are durable. When you have a win-lose, when you paint it red, not blue, you win. I'm going to tell you, you turn your back and you're going to come home and the, house, and the room's going to be blue. Because it's not going to last. They're at some point, they're still fighting for blue. If we come up to interest-based solutions and have our conflict through an interest-based lens, the solutions last forever because we all won and we all wanted it and we can support it and we can stay with it. Mutual gain, and that, they often call this mutual gains negotiation, mutual gains problem solving. It is possible. We can both get better as a result of having this conversation. The biggest difference is this values our relationship. It's not just creating a conflict and having an outcome. We're actually going to build our relationship in the long run. Um, I'm going to turn this on. Let me know if you can hear it. If you can't, put something in the... music playing. Anybody hear it? Cute little, those of you that have ever done any um, IBN stuff, you know the thumbs up was comes from that. That's how we, that's how we make decisions in true interest-based negotiation settings is thumbs up, you meet all my interests, thumbs sideways, you meet them well enough, I can live with it, thumbs down, it's a veto. 
So what are interests? Concerns, wants, needs, desires, and fears relative to the problem that we're trying to solve. So what I'd like you know, people to do in an interest-based conversation is to tell you why, probably, why, why we're solving the problem. What's, what's, what's the deal here? Um, a story I tell is my wife, we, our car broke down and I was out of town somewhere um, for a while and, and the car broke down and it's 112 degrees here. And she called me and she said, I'm selling the effing car. And I said, what are you talking about? It's a, it's a fine car. It's newer. It's not, no, I'm selling. And I said, why? And she goes, I'm out of air conditioning. I'm in the middle of this. It's a stressful, there's a stressful time going on. Um, and she said, I'm just not driving it and I'm getting rid of it. I said, well, I don't understand. I don't care. I'm getting rid of it. I'm going to sell it. I said, well, let's fix the air conditioning first. $35 fuse. Um, got it fixed. And I said, okay, hold off. I'll be home. We'll talk about it. Got home. And I said, well, she goes, I just want a Prius. I want a red Prius. I said, why? She goes, I don't know. I just want a red Prius. Fuel, fuel's better. I say, you drive five miles to work. Uh, it, it's more expensive than the fuel. I don't understand. Well, I don't care. I want to sell this car. So, you know, we had a conversation for a while. Her position was very much, I'm going to sell a car, I'm going to buy a red Prius. If we'd been married, it would have been okay. We would have done it, but I still didn't understand it. Finally, we had a day when we were having a conversation about it again, and, and the comment was, well, when I walk out and see the car that I'm driving now, it makes me feel old. And I want, I, I right now with everything going on, I need to feel young and 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 engaged again i need something exciting and that's one way that i could do that okay because my interests were i want her to be comfortable and happy and all and i was I, at that point i wasn't sure that the red prius would do it but as soon as i heard that it was like okay that's going to work and we're still driving the red prius to this day and it, and it meant that but we had to talk about interests we had to get past the position of i want to buy a car and my interest was well i don't why are we spending money on something we don't need then it became more about mutual interests of, I, I want to feel better about myself. I want her to feel better about herself. We had mutual interests. We were able to come up with a much better solution to do that. So that's a simple kind of solution rather than a work solution. But it, maybe that will help you understand how that can be used in real life. In, in this, and I hear it's called negotiation, but in this conflict that we're having, interest is the best way to do this. But, you know, sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes this falls off and it just doesn't work. You talk about your interests, they talk about yours, you can't find common solutions, and it falls out. Well, here's where it goes. It goes to rights. I have the right to make the decision. I'm the boss. Or I have the right to make the decision. I'm the one that earns more money. Or I'm, I have the right to do it because I'm faculty and our RFP, our, our residential faculty policies say this. So I could do that. I have the right to. Sometimes if, that, if you don't have a, a clear understanding of who has stronger rights in the situation, goes to power and then it becomes you know we're the board we get to decide we're the we're the boss i'm i'm in power here it's not about rights it's about power and those are always um destructive to relationships whenever we have to go to rights or power they're not they're not building relationships they're they're um, destructing relationships um a, a, a maricopa story is that when the faculty association, and I, I know some of you aren't there and you might not understand, but our faculty association, we don't have a union, but the association bought a building off, off site and they'd already had an office in the large district offices where our representatives would go to meetings and they bought a building off site for a lot of reasons, a lot of them having to do with money and political action committees and things, but they did. Well, now our, our folks that represent us were in the district building all the time, but they had no place to sit between meetings. They had no place to work, they had no computers. In the contract, it actually says that the district had to provide the faculty association with office space. It says that right in the contract. But instead of going to them and saying, we have a right to an office, we want it. We went to them and said, look, we want to participate in all these meetings. Our people are here. It will help us be a, a greater asset to you and have more input from us if between meetings we have a place to do some work. Could you help us figure out how to meet that interest? Because our interest is we just want to serve you better we need time and a place to work. We need a, a place where we can close the door and have have uh, some confidence in, in people not hearing and overhearing. We just don't want to be in the hallways. And, and I'm going to tell you, the next day, they arranged for this beautiful office with the highest tech computers, and it was great. It was an awesome setting. What could have happened is if we would have gone to them and said, we have a right to, a, to a, an office, we would have gotten the broom closet converted into, a, into a, an office. They put a chair and a desk in a broom closet and said, here you go, bring your own computer because there's nothing in the contract about computers. So instead, we met mutual interests, right? 
we had an interest, they saw their interest, we found a better solution than that. So it could be in a simple conflict or, or that wasn't even become conflict because we reached it from an in, interest perspective. So here's that same paradigm about interest. It, it does take time and talent. It's slower than somebody just saying this is the way it is. It's slower than pulling out the contract and saying you have to do this. But if we can find, and I'm telling you, I'm working with a college right now that has a union and they're having all kinds of trouble getting their faculty to go online because their faculty are saying, you have to pay for my internet at home now. I have a right to that. And I'm working with another college that's going through where all the faculty are going online and their union saying, we just want what's best for students. How can we help do this? We'll figure it out. We'll work with you to make this happen. And guess what? The college is going to help them support their computers and their internet and all. Not because they were asked or because they had to, but because that's the best thing to do for mutual interest. But instead of going with a, with a, a demand and a position and an anger, they went to them with an interest. And two completely different colleges managed different ways, different unions, different um, presidents, they, not the same settings. But the outcomes were so dramatically different, it really set me up as an example. Um, with our interest, we have, we have greater satisfaction. Everybody's happier. The compliance is durable. It lasts. It doesn't go away quickly when there's a new boss. And the quality of the relationship goes up. We are better with each other. So what I'd like you to do is instead of being an adversary, I'd like you to be an advocate for your interests. Fight for your interests. Don't fight the person. Don't fight the position. Fight for your interests. What do you want? What do you need? What do you fear? Why do you want this? You figure that out and then go fight for that. Figure out the why. Figure out the why behind it. We won't spend much time on this. It, it's a little complicated, but this is something called a batten or a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. What this says is <clears throat> there is some level at which you're going to have to accept the outcome, even if it's not perfect. And you're going to go in and ask for a raise. <clears throat> if your BATNA is 25 cents an hour and they offer you 12, you have to quit. Because they didn't meet your best alternative. If your interest is you want to keep your job and you want the 25 cents, but you would accept it if they say, no, you're not quitting. You're not leaving. Even if they give you no, no um, raise, and then your batting is zero. Now you don't communicate that. You don't talk about it, but in your head, you need to know when you enter into any conversation, what you're willing to do. You're going to go buy a house. You probably have some idea where you're willing to, to spend or what your budget is or what your limits are. And that's what a batting is. It's a complicated issue sometimes. If you ever really get involved in some of this stuff deeper, let me know and we can talk some more about it. So what's interest-based do? It separates the people from the problem. This is not about people. It's about the issue. We like each other. We're trying to build our relationship. We're talking about the room color. We're not talking about really you're smart or dumb or good or bad or strong or weak. We focus on interests, not positions. We generate multiple options because here's what we do with that room. I talk about red because I want something that's going to energize and exciting. And by the way, I remember red when I was a kid and there was this red wall and it was, and the blue says, well, I want, I want something that reminds me of vacation and the ocean and the sky. So guess what? We go find at Home Depot or, or, or I don't know, does Canadian Tire sell paint? They sell everything else, Canadian Tire, but whatever your hardware place is or your, where you can buy paint chips, you go in and you try to find a color paint that that helps me remember my childhood and helps them remember the ocean and the sky and the vacations and we find a different color it might be peach who knows i don't know but maybe there's a new solution that wasn't even on the table to begin with but we can both be really happy evaluate by objective criteria and interest in other words there are limits to budgets there are limits to things we know that there's things you can't do they're illegal but we should be looking only limiting by that and then by our interest I need what I want, what I fear. And then you should accept the outcome if it's anything better than your bad. So what are the barriers? Well, single answers, assuming that the pie is fixed, that you, there's only a yes and a no, assuming their problem is theirs and not yours. <clears throat> their problem is your problem, folks. If you're having conflict. Their problem is your problem. It's a mutual connection that you fail to get enough information to be able to come up with good solutions. And maybe you need to leave and go get more information and then have your conflict. Too much emotion, true, and that's not always easy to control in other people, but we try to set an environment. You should stop jumping to your conclusions <clears throat> and keep that, that um, idea of wonder and curiosity as we go through our conflict from an interest perspective. 
Um, we tend to want to stay in the box and are fearful of coming out of the box. I know that's an overused phrase, but being creative, we're sometimes fearful of that. And we fear risk. And some people, rightfully so, should do that and bring that to the table as an interest. My interest is I'm afraid that if we do this, there, there is a great risk at it. Well, then explain the risk and let's talk about it and let's find an interest that meets those risk issues rather than just not doing it because you think it's too risky. Okay. Um, and I'll close with, with just a couple of brief things here and we're going to be done. <clears throat> Another book that I'm going to suggest because Part of this is the ability to speak directly. And the book, uh, Radical Candor, is, a, I think, uh, a great read. I, I, I encourage it in people that are reaching this point in their, in their development where they're ready for this. Um, it, it connects with interests and it connects with crucial conversations. In that, one of the things that we need to be able to do is give radical candor. We need to be able to be honest and direct and explain what we're thinking. And this book will help you do that. What it says is, in simple terms, is that you need to care personally about the person in the relationship. So if you don't care about them and you don't care about the relationship, then go be, a, go be whatever. Go be positional, fight it out, win, lose, whatever. If you care about the relationship, and you should with your boss and your coworkers and your, and your colleagues, if you care about them personally, and then you can challenge them directly. You can be honest and candid in what you say. That's the best place to be. If you don't care about them and you're aggressive, then you're obnoxious. You're aggressive. If you care about them, but you can't challenge them, and I'm going to suggest there's a bunch of folks in that category. You care so much that you're afraid to be direct with them, then you become renuous. You, you hurt them. Empathy is bad. It's hurting them. You're not being honest with them. And if you don't care and don't challenge them, then you're manipulative. It's just kind of, you're. yeah, I'll let them just make their own mistakes. Um, one of the, the early um, examples she uses is a new employee that she's known prior to this employment comes to work for her. By the way, she was at Facebook and she was at Google for a while. She a, was a pretty high level and she's out doing her own work. She had an employee come. First project he did, he didn't do real well. She was a little afraid to tell him that. He was new, he was learning, so she just took the project and finished it herself. And she did everything that needed to be done and made it work. Two years later, a little less than that, she fired him because he can't do the work. And his only comment to her was, why the hell didn't you tell me this a long time ago? Why am I just hearing now that I'm not doing my work? The reality is, if that very first time he brought that project to her, because she did care about it, she did. If she would have been candidly direct with him and said, this is not up to standard. I need you to take this back and I need you to fix it. If you need my help to fix it, I'm happy to do that. I can support you. I can be more specific in what you need to do, but this is not up to, up to standard. If she would have done that in the first place, he would have gotten better or he would have quit. <laughs> it, it, we wouldn't have gotten to two years later and then have a meltdown and a breakdown. I'm going to suggest it was not fair to him to not be direct with him up front. So sometimes in this whole conflict issue, it, it, what I don't want you to think is that productive conflict is withdraw. You don't withdraw because you have empathy for other people or you're fearful of their reaction. You, that is not productive conflict. Productive conflict is you care for them personally. You care about the people as a human being, and then you are able to challenge them more directly. That has, goes back to that vulnerable trust piece that you build in order to, to show that you care and that you can challenge them. Okay? Great read if you have the opportunity to do so. Um, next week, we will really get into the crucial conversations piece, which is you actually designing a conversation. It will not be as much me lecturing, so to speak, which is not the best way to always to do these things. Um, but, I, but I will be here to, to help you create a, a really good script, if you will, for a difficult conversation that you might be wishing to have. Um, if not, you make one up, but I bet most of you have something that you've been avoiding with somebody. Big, small, doesn't matter. And you don't have to share it. You're not going to share it with anybody else on the webinar. I don't mean that. But you'll have a chance to write those out. I'd download the handout before then if you have the opportunity to, um, so you could have something to jot on. By the way, next Tuesday, I'm doing another webinar at 9 a.m. Phoenix time. 
It's three hours different than Ontario and the East Coast. It's two hours different than Central Time because Arizona does not go on daylight time. We are exactly the same time as California and British Columbia. Um, that's our time zone, okay? So that's 9 a.m. in British Columbia or Los Angeles, um, not necessarily anywhere else. So if you're trying to figure that out, it's at 9 o'clock um, on Tuesday, the 7th. Uh, we're going to talk about managing, engaging uh, remote uh, workers and teams. And there, we talked about that a little bit in the last session. There are some, I think, some good research and some good paradigm on what we can do to help support our workers and build team and community out um, as we're going through these tough times. So I, I like this quote, so I put it up, because no matter how hard a conversation is, I know that on the other side of that difficult conversation lies peace, knowledge, an answer is delivered, character is revealed, truces are formed, and misunderstandings are resolved. So it's a matter of actually having the conversation that sometimes can really build relationships along the way to what I just put up. Um, so I will, I, I'm here. I'm not going to log off for until the last person logs off. Um, if you'd like to comment, you'd, now's the time to unmute and comment. I didn't give you a chance to talk much during that. Um, I'd love to hear anything you have to say or comments. Um, you can put something in the chat room if you'd like. I'm done with the content. Um, but if you've got other questions or other conversations, I'd be happy to have that. And I'll, I'll hang out here until you've all logged off to our next next interests along the way of your day it's a busy day thank you by the way all of you for being here and being engaged i really appreciate it a lot it's uh it's what i can do to to uh, 